Uh, well, we're all here to hear Francisca Saavedra present, but before she does, I'm just going to give a little bit of background. So thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Bob Bushfagger. I'm with the TCD program. Uh, and the TCD program has a long history of working to integrate theory with practice, and especially uh, we have an area of strength in community-based conservation. So we've been doing this for a long period of time. Um, and particularly in 2018, we held a workshop called Tools and Strategies for Conservation and Development in the Amazon, Lessons Learned and Future Pathways. I have a couple of copies of this, and I'll leave one up here if you want to grab one when you leave. But if you want to pass this around, you're welcome to look at it. Uh, but out of that conference, a specific project emerged, and if you call two, two major themes that emerged were governance and infrastructure. And the project that we implemented from 28, you can leave it there, um, from 2018 to 2021 was called Governance and Infrastructure in the Amazon. And it was a learning network, where, and which is signified by this network diagram of 28 partner organizations that participated in this project. And there are different, one of the key things was that we integrated different kinds of knowledge and different kinds of organizations. So the circles here are NGOs and the colors indicate the country. For, so NGOs from Peru, NGOs from Colombia, uh, NGOs from Brazil. And then we also had academic organizations, uh, universities in Bolivia and uh, grassroots and social organizations. So the INGA from Colombia and, and all of these organizations we Create this learning network based on themes and regional groups. So we had a regional group in Brazil. You see those are the different kinds of organizations. They focused on a theme of legal action. Another focused on knowledge management in the upper Madeira basin of the Bolivia-Brazil border. Another group focused on indigenous training and intercultural collaboration in Colombia. And this pan-Amazon group with members from all the different countries focused on communication and, and mobilization for impact. So this was a learning network project that ended in 2021. Uh, we have a website. One of the cool things about the project that we produced many products and there's about a list of about 50 products on our website and most of them have mm -hmm. counterparts in a kind of an academic analysis and a community useful tool, like with infographics or different kinds of language. Uh, so these partners were, these products were co-produced and shared and meant to be useful and in formats that could be useful for these community organizations. Okay, and another really cool thing about this project illustrated here is how it was implemented by the University of Florida. So these blue circles are the virtual working groups that we, carried out in part with, with groups of partners from outside of UF, but these are all the people from within UF. We had students, we had faculty, several of them over here, Steve, Marianne. Uh, we had a couple of coordinators, Andrea Chavez and myself, and Andrea is also a co-producer of this presentation, but unfortunately she's traveling, she couldn't be here. We had some postdocs, so we worked as a virtual network and learn from each other within TCD and with partners, okay? So that was a three-year experience. We had some main findings about infrastructure and governance in the Amazon. One of them was that grassroots organizations who don't work on their own, they work with partners, but they were statistically more likely to have an impact on governance and infrastructure than other types of organizations. So it's really important to include them as key actors. And key strategies that were impactful in terms of controlling or managing infrastructure and governance had to do with political action and negotiation. And the other thing was the grassroots leaders were very engaged with this project. So uh, uh, it was really their insight and, and co-learning that was really one of the things that stood out. But we also heard from them and documented that how you work with them is really important. So specific, and, and, and in fact, directly focused on power 
how you allocate power about knowledge, about how you organize interactions, how your action and agenda is set. So we learned and documented really how the power relations, even among allies, is important. Of course, we knew our relations with dam companies or governments is really important, but even between NGOs, universities, and grassroots organizations, they really emphasize how you interact and how you collaborate. Not just that you're there and automatically it's kumbaya. You really have to work on how you work together. And so we tried to uh, develop a new phase of GEO back in 2021. And we're, this is a progress report. Okay, so we started by forming a working group of those partners, emphasizing the grassroots organizations and the NGOs and universities who work very closely with them because we learned how important they are for infrastructure governance. And they told us they want to be protagonists of a new project, not beneficiaries. We asked them to help us design UF's future project, and they really turned around and said, you help us design our future project that we want to implement. And we did that. And we had this conference, February 2022, where we developed a project concept uh, and a funding proposal that they unfortunately have not uh, been able to sell to donors yet, but it's still a live proposal that uh, this is a concept. It's not actually a project. It doesn't have a budget. It doesn't have actually details about who would implement it, but it leaves clear that these organizations would be the protagonists and lead, and this is what they want to do and how they envision it. And so it's a concept, and we realized that this concept is best in terms of academic terms characterized as the concept that they presented to us at this conference, and you can see it in this video, is best called biocultural conservation. Okay, so that's bringing us to where we are today. And one of the things that donors told us is, well, what are you doing having facilitating these organizations and, and developing projects, and you're not a project administrator, et cetera, you really need to define the university's role. We heard that from the Moore Foundation, and we heard that from the Ford Foundation. The university can be a powerful player in supporting these organizations. Ford Foundation was very interested in that. But the project that we articulated with partners didn't really discuss its particular role for University of Florida. So that's the project that we're doing now. And in fact, Sunamar and Andre and I, we present on the trophy lunch here in January. And so this is kind of a progress report. And we're working towards four products. And I, basically, Francisca's presentation is going to be about one of these projects. But just a little bit of background first. The first product is a concept paper about how we understand what is biocultural conservation. <clears throat> Based on a literature review, group of students working on this together, uh, and basically found two key concepts that need to be incorporated in biocultural conservation. The interdependence of biological and cultural diversity. Effective conservation requires integrated conservation strategies across biophysical and cultural realms. Think about knowledge, spirituality, and language. And indigenous or community, agency, and empowerment. Or community, because I think a lot of what we're learning is focused on indigenous, but is relevant to other traditional populations and people who have rights to territory and a sense of place. So um, I think this is a little bit broader than indigenous, but the literature talks mostly about indigenous agency and empowerment. So local communities with sovereign territory and a strong sense of identity, place, and social integration are the key protagonists of biocultural conservation. So that comes from this literature. It also comes from our findings in GEA Project. So that's product one. Product two, we have a student working group doing a literature review of 72 recent papers. Sinomar is leading this, and Nesley is working on it. Uh, they're Sylvia, Laura. Uh, and how to implement biocultural conservation, what the literature tells us about actually how you put this into practice. And we're still working on that, but we identified five emergent themes. And again, indigenous empowerment and agency comes up very strongly but also the idea of collaboration and partnership so they can be supported, knowledge, rights and governance, and territorial resource or species management. So there's a lot of nuance here that we're working on 
articulating and really understanding a little bit better. But just that's the second of four products. And the last two products, and now this is my handing it off to Francisca, has to do with the role of academia and then what are the opportunities and future actions for TCP. Okay, so a little bit of background about how we got here and what biocultural conservation it is and, and how they implement it on the ground. And now back to the key question that we were challenged to answer and to think about our own opportunities and future action is really a more general view of what is the role of academia. So I'm going to stop sharing if I can and then pass it on to Sylvia, who's going to introduce Francisca. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Bushbecker. So um, now we're going to have the presentation of Francisca Saavedra. So Francisca received a bachelor degree in biology from the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile and came to the USA with a TCD fellowship to pursue a graduate studies. Um, she received a master's degree uh, from the geography department at the University of Florida and a PhD from the biology department at the University of Maryland. Uh, her research interests are climate change impacts, biodiversity, biocultural conservation, and education. So today, Francisca will talk about biocultural conservation in higher education. Thank you very much, Francisca. Thank you. you I'll, share I'll put share my screen, okay? Can you hear me well? Yeah. Good. Yeah. But we don't see you. Um, oh, remove the pin? Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Can you see me now? I don't know. I don't see myself. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah? Yes, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Ready. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, I am nervous. I wanted to tell you that first. But I also wanted to tell you that this is a real honor to be with you and share some of the stories and insights I gained exploring the field of biocultural conservation in higher education. I did this through reading and many- um, That's this, I'm sorry. That we can see your notes. Do you want to turn them off? The transcript. The transcript. Um, I didn't know how to do it. So okay. that's why they're there. Oh, no. oh. Are they annoying? Is it oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, no, more caption. Yeah, you yeah. off like caption settings here. Caption settings. Caption. Like off. Where is it? <laughs> Works really well. <laughs> Apparently. It yes. might help people, I guess, because I do have an accent. So I think sometime it uh, might help for those that don't understand me. And then, like, show captions. But I don't know how to take it there. Click um, down, down the menu, maybe there's one. Here? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's okay. I think we have to live with it. I couldn't do it either. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, this adventure, I would say, of doing this work, it was really an adventure and a fantastic intellectual adventure. Um, and I am very enthusiastic, if not passionate, about the work we did uh, with Andrea and uh, Bob. I think I need to explain this. The title uh, it starts. Let's talk story. Have you ever heard that title, that that expression before? Any of you? No. Nope, me neither, until I talked to Dr. Christopher Dunn and uh, Cornell, who used it. Um, it is an expression used in Hawaii that people use in Hawaii to have conversations, to get to know each other. Um, and it's an expression that he used uh, when he explained the role of universities this day, the need that universities have to talk stories to, to reach out to indigenous leaders and ask them to sit down and talk and talk and talk again 
and build relationship of trust. Um, stories are also um, very moving. So that's another power of story. Okay, can you see this? Um, this is um, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer and um, I wanted to show her, although I didn't interview her, I uh, I knew about her um, and she is the inspiration for my interest in biocultural conservation. I entered this field um, not knowing much and um, and uh, Suzuki, this is Zen Mon calls this beginner's mind. Um, and um, and uh, um, Robin Walkimer is a very um, prominent figure in, in this country at least, and has made the field of biocultural conservation um, accessible to um, the public. She wrote the book, um, um, Braiding Sweetgrass. How many of you have read that book? I cannot see you, but perhaps some voices. I see one voice that I hand from Bob. Uh, <laughs> so that's the only hand I can see. I cannot see, I can see my the screen there, but I imagine some of you have read it. Um, she is um, a MacArthur Fellow, a faculty at SUNY, um, and also a, a, an indigenous person. And an exquisite storyteller. Um, if you haven't heard her voice, I recommend you go to YouTube and listen to her voice telling stories. Um, so Robin uh, inspired me through stories. And this talk today is really not an academic talk. It's a talk that I'm, I have developed thinking in how do I also inspire you? How do I touch your heart and um, perhaps make you also enthusiastic to learn more about this field and to learn about the power of this field of biocultural conservation? Okay, next. So this is the report that was published this month. Um, beautiful. The, the the image was created by an artist at the University of Maryland and uh, Rick Bessio. And the questions on the on the on the right are the questions that oriented the work. Who is contributing to the field? What is needed in the field? What is the role of academia in biocultural conservation? Um, so we document the best practices, we listen to the experts' insights um, and to their insight into the future. Very exciting. Um, and I haven't defined the term. So I invite you to think about this, um, to think about how important is the biocultural, biocultural conservation. And this is your opinion without even defining it for you. I hope you know a little bit, if you don't need to know. See if you can answer this. This is my first time using this mentee, so hopefully it works. Is it working? Can you see? Can you go in there? Yeah. One, super important. One vote. Going down. Okay. Keep on going a little bit more. Wow. Well, this is a very special group, obviously. <laughs> so most of you see how this field is very important. Let me see, close this voting. Okay, thank you. 
Um, okay, so I guess we are on, on, on good terms here. Um, okay, so I love this definition. This definition is the definitions that Anna Porsinkowski uh, gave me. Actually, it's not hers. It um, was shared with her by Eleanor Sterling. Um, and um, Anna works in, in, the, in the American Museum of Natural History. And she worked with Eleanor for many years. Um, sadly, she also passed uh, uh, early this year. But I love this definition. And what I like the best about this is that if you look at this at the beginning of the, the definition, Biocultural approach to conservation is all about the process. So to me, that means it's all about the how. It's not about what many view as sort of the great challenges. My concern with climate change, it's not about biocultural conservation or climate change. It's about how we go about dealing with the problems they are very uh, important this, this year, bioculture, uh, climate change, biodiversity loss, et cetera, et cetera. So I think biocultural conservation is an approach to conservation that's grounded in local culture practices and need and shows us how we, do, how we go about doing conservation. How do we do this? Okay. Nice map. And these are the people I interview. They're all over the map or not all over the map. We selected about, we selected 27 programs. Um, and um, then we gave priority for interviews to those organizations that are mainly universities that were doing research or, or training for graduate students and biocultural conservation and some NGOs that either were very important in the field or had some sort of linkage to universities. What do you notice in that map? What is sort of striking? That's why I use the map. I, I heard a voice. The people in the audience can scream, I guess. US. U.S. Okay, so it's mostly not only U.S. It's, it's U.S. and Canada. Okay, this I I and it's because of the search I did. I did a, a use English word, so most likely we'll find uh, people that use the term in English, biocultural conservation, um, and also the people that were, were recommended by TCD, which also are uh, there were many of them were in, in the U.S. What else do you notice? I don't hear, but so I, I, I think I will say continue with what you, some one of you said. They are mostly in the northern part of the states and Canada. Uh, Dr. Mathis in Canada, Dr. Frey, uh, uh, David Sandlev is in Canada, Dr. Musa is, uh, is in Canada. And we have those mainly there in Canada, but we have a few exceptions. We have also, also Hawaii here, uh, 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 Dr. Gavin in Colorado and Simone in Florida. Simone is the former TCD student, by the way. Okay, let's start. So those are the faces of the people I interview. And this is Dr. Risa Mappi. She is one of the pioneers in the field of biocultural conservation and the co-founder of Ter Terra Lingua. Terra Lingua is an NGO based in Canada and the st in the States, uh, whose mission is to, um, ma mainly an educational mission, I will say, not only, but. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk about her because in selecting the people for the interview for the report, I skipped her. Given what I know now, I should have selected her um, and given her pri priority for, for interview analysis. Um, so I did after the report was written and it was great. Um, 
So I will show you a little snippet about her and others, about the things I learned, the stories they told me. Um, the concept of biocultural diversity, by the way, was the result of conversations between Dr. Luisa Maffi, and a, she's an anthropologist and linguistic with the biologist, Dr. David Harmon in 1995. And these conversations gave rise to Terra Lingua and to a conference in 1996 that really started the field of uh, biocultural diversity. Um, so that's 25 years or so ago, more. Um, let's go to the next one. And biocultural conservation is more and more uh, in the forefront. And Luisa told me when we talked that the idea of biocultural diversity, biocultural conservation was very odd, queer in 1995. But now it's very different. And this is an example. Um, you said that Canada, for example, has now what they call the IPCAs, and it's their Indigenous Protected and Conserved Areas. And this is a very um, innovative and wonderful way to protect areas. And they are, um, by default, led by Indigenous people. And they are, in general, represent also a long commitment to conservation because Indigenous people don't think about only one generation. They think in multi-generational times, the seven generation concept. And at the same time, they elevate Indigenous rights and responsibility. The picture there is from um, a Canadian uh, NGO conservation and reconciliation um, conservation for reconciliation partnership. And you can re read a bit more about that there. Um, so this is a movement right now, and not only in Canada and many other countries in this one too, in the United States. Um, and Luisa emphasized that this indigenous movement needs the support from all well-being, all well-meaning beings and organizations, and among them needs the support from universities. Um, she thinks that this work starts in education and research institutions, and it starts with inter and transdisciplinary approaches to teaching and learning. A lot of what Bob and I am Andrea and others are working right now. And um, I wanted to share this because um, Christopher Dunn told in one of the, the in the interview this uh, uh, from Cornell, the importance of arts. And when talking to Luisa, she, said, share with me this most incredible vision for the new university, the university of the future. And there is an artist working on this. So this, this, what you see right now is not what she said, it's my attempt to try to explain her vision. So I'm gonna read what she said and close your eyes because I find it so beautiful. Somehow's this vision formed in my mind, the new university. And what I saw and then expressed to my colleagues who were sitting there was this idea. First of all, it was not made out of a bunch of square building. It's just one big circular building. And there are no departments, but there are kinds of hubs and you move and you have to circulate around like you know, in ancient Greece, the followers of Aristotle who we, who walk, uh, hmm, who, wow, who teaching and learning, who, who taught and learned while walking. So you have to constantly move around and absorb all the pieces of this big puzzle. Furthermore, there aren't really walls, the walls outside. 
they are almost like, you know, these tentacles that lead you into the society, into the real world. So the walls of academia have come down and there is an intimate connection between academia and the real world. Oh, I found this just incredible. And, um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to see the depiction of this vision by, by the artist Ingrid and, uh, here. Okay. Um, can't you imagine? <laughs> okay. Okay, let's continue with more stories. Um, and this is Dr. Uh, Mike uh, Gavin. Uh, he is one of the first ones I interview, and he's a faculty at the University at the Colorado State University. He is one of the co-authors of, uh, of this very famous paper of 2015, defining biocultural approaches to conservation. One of the co-authors is Dr. Richard Stepp, a faculty. You can see a little picture of him on the bottom. Uh, a member of the anthropology department and a TCD, um, on TCD at the University of Florida. This is one of the most cited, cited papers in biocultural conservation. Dr. Gavin White Talk is a very clear thinker and speaker. If you have a chance, listen to his TED Talk. Um, it was really, really nice talking to him. And um, also because he was one of the first one, I didn't record it. So I had to really uh, stop after the interview and write my notes and try to remember everything he said. Um, but one of the concepts that impressed me the most in our conversation is the one in the quote. The role of academia is to establish collaborations with NGOs, organizations, and communities to change the paradigm of biodiversity conservation. And we don't have time for this, but I would like you to take notes there for conversations with your friends and write and think about what is the current paradigm in conservation and what is this new paradigm that Dr. Gavin is referring to. More stories. And uh, on the bottom, you see Dr. Anna Porsikansky, the one, uh, Anna is the director for the Center of Biodiversity and Conservation at the American Museum of Natural History. Um, although she did not her degree, it did not get, she did not get her degree at TCD, she grew up close to TCD because of her parents at TCD faculty. She was very generous with her time and a super ally in this project and an example of the power of networking. Uh, when I talked to her, um, she introduced me to the late Dr. Eleanor Sterling and, and how her uh, work um, and approach has affected the work that is happening at the American Museum of Natural History. Inc. Um, Dr. Sterling uh, was um, at the museum for more than 20 years until 2021. Um, then she moved to the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii. Um, as I said before, um, we lost her early this year. But her influence, um, and this is what Anna was very, uh, very good at, at, at sharing, her influence can be seen um, very heavily still at the at the American Museum of Natural History, um, and most significantly um, in the number of people she mentored. Anna was one of her mentees. Rachel Dax, who I interviewed later at Hawaii, is another mentee. Chris uh, Filardi, another mentee, and many many others. Um, And in my conversations with Anna, this is the sentence at least that I will remember the most. And I still use it and think about it. Uh, learn to move at the speed of trust. And this is what she answered when I asked her about the challenge in the field of the challenges of in the field of biocultural conservation. Think about it. 
and you can try to answer if, if you have a voice there. What is the speed of trust to build relationships when you work in the field? You can perhaps share in the chat on on, on screen there in the in the uh, in the room. Next time I will go to Florida and give a talk there. Huh? What is the speed of trust? Any guesses to build trust? I hear I see one voice. Bob, I cannot get to the chat. Perhaps you can tell me. Yeah, one of the comments are from Carolina and she says like trust. Uh, let me see it again. Trust that we are nature. Mm -hmm. And how many years will it take to build trust? In the community, for example. Okay. So I I want to share you one one example, and this is one case study. I interviewed Steve Ganti informally. He's a friend at in Smithsonian, who worked for many years in in communities of fishermen in the Caribbean. He said that after ten years of talking about marine reserves to a group of of of, pe of people in the area, they knock at his door while he was having dinner. They said, "We want that you were talking about." What he said. Do you mean a marine reserve? Yes, we do. We do want that. And he stopped eating and back, went back to work. It took 10 years for this community to trust him on what he was talking about, what he was proposing to them. So it takes time. Um, okay, how is the time? I'm going to pass this time. Um, so... This is Rachel Dax, who I interview after interview, and Anna, and again, the power of networking. Um, Rachel um, is currently, I believe, a, a postdoc at the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology. She is, um, will be um, faculty and assistant faculty um, uh, in 2024. And she worked very close with Eleanor Sterling, too, and share with me a wealth of information about the University of Hawaii and the many initiatives in, 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 in biocultural conservation. Um, I just want to say that our team knew that Hawaii and the University of Hawaii was an important leader in the field. It was just hard to find someone that could talk to us. And here are some of the, in, the, the insights or, or some of the uh, initiatives that are happening in Hawaii. The Biocultural Initiative of the Pacific is one of them that uh, unites or brings together faculty and students interested in bio biocultural conservations. And because there are many people interested in working in biocultural conservation, they're all spread out throughout the university. This initiative, by the way, was uh, led uh, by uh, Dr. Christopher Dunn when he was in Hawaii. Um, the Hawaii has also the, uh, the initiative to become a nat native Hawaiian place of learning. Um, and this is an initiative that from 1886 has percolated in many ways throughout the university. Uh, for example, Rachel teaches a, a course uh, for marine biologists, a two week course before for incoming students. And she teaches them um, about uh, place-based methodologies in Hawaii. She said it's a really a, a course that shakes students to, to the core. Um, and these are students not necessarily working in biocultural conservation, the students that will work in Hawaii. Um, this is um, a publication I found it in, in the report that I found it very inspiring, Hawaiian Renaissance that could save the world. This is a, a, a it was written for the public um, in the American Scientist by uh, Sam Ohugan from the Nature Conservancy and Dr. Kawika Winter there in the lower, lower right. Uh, he's at the University of Hawaii. I interviewed him after the report was written. Um, and uh, what I found uh, amazing about the story is the, the power of a location, a, a, the, that the university is located in a place in Hawaii where there is the Renaissance, where people are going back to their roots and reclaiming their culture. 
And so the two things are going together. Hawaii and, and the University of Hawaii are leading in many ways the efforts in biocultural conservation. Again, not, it's not the only place, but it's a really great example. Um, how much time do I have? Perhaps I can skip this one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Christopher Dunder in the bottom is now in the Cornell Botanic Garden. And um, he was very friendly. He accepted my invitation to talk right away and uh, gave me a lot of time too. And uh, he's the one who uh, was very uh, adamant about, adamant is perhaps not the word, very enthusiastic or very clear about the role of the the arts in the field of biocultural conservation as a way to inspire. Um, and, and he shared also about the role of academia moving forward. Um, so, and he really believed that universities have a very powerful voice that they ought to use to move change, to trigger change. And he talked about uh, the role of land grad universities like Cornell, their need to grapple with the history of occupation and disposition of Native American land by being beneficiaries of the Murray Act, and, um, and the need to come into terms with this history of occupation and, and find ways to reconciliate and restitute. Um, he also introduced me to uh, Dr. Uh, Karim Ali Kassam, who I interviewed after the report was written. And Dr. Kassam is doing a marvelous work in biocultural conservation nationally, internationally. And he has also a very profound insights into education. If you are curious, look at his website. And he is, for me, a great example of how biocultural approach can be used to address climate change. Um, he is, and this is my humble opinion, a very wise soul. I was very impressed after talking to him. And okay, we're coming close to the end. I have the last two programs. Um, uh, I left them at the end, not because they were less important, because they um great examples and inspiration of how to operationalize, how to put bioconservation in practice and to see their power. So on the upper right, upper right, you see Dr. Faisal Mullah. Um, yeah, we had a fascinating conversation. <laughs> and I'm just gonna show you a little bit of that. Um, he wrote in a recent paper with Jessica Lukaweki um, how biocultural conservation has emerged but has not been really operationalized yet. I believe that the work that he is doing is, uh, is to, to try to, to see how can this be bring down to earth. And I will mention two initiatives uh, with him. One is the curriculum of the Masters of Conservation Leadership that he's part of, that, for example, include, among others, indigenous leaders in the teaching role. So there is this exchange in both ways. And, um, and here on the bottom, you can see him here on the bottom. Uh, he's co-leading the NGO Conservation Through Reconciliation Partnership. Um, and he is co-leading with five indigenous people and two university-based academics. This to me is a great example of, of co-leading, is, is, is letting go of power and, and bringing these different views and different ways of knowing really in the in, in a leadership position. Um, Um, okay, and, and the Field Museum. Um, we were very curious about the Field Museum. Uh, well, some of us, I didn't really know, uh, knew that a lot of work in biocultural conservation was happening there. I can find nothing just searching around in, in the website. The website is really hard to navigate. 
So I interviewed Tita, uh, also a connection through Anna, uh, Persica, uh, she's in the lower left. Uh, Tita is amazing. She's just has so much energy and she's just in, so fun talking to her. She is now in Legado, but worked for 10 or more years at the Pio Museum. Um, and um, in the summer after the report, I also was able to talk to um, Dr. Paula Unger and, and Dr. Corinne Wiesendorf um, in, in the field. And I, I understand a lot better now what their work is. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit here. So the museum, this is what Corinne told me in the summer. The museum said had their mission, the initial mission was to explore the earth and its people. Um, she said they started as a really colonial and a little bit big. At that moment, they say, but wait a minute, what are we doing for the well-being of the earth and its people? So they started this very small conservation effort, which initially was made of small group of biologists. Uh, they have been doing wraps for Conservation International. And they they included in their version, the social scientists. So the team was made of biologists and social scientists. Tita was part of that team as a social scientist. And this uh, rapid biological and social inventories are very much grounded in a bioculture approach. And the next slide is, I hope you can see how powerful this can be. Um, this is the page that you cannot find very easily, but is in the report, the link to this page. This is uh, the rapid biological social inventories. They've been going for 22 years and look how much area it has been conserved. Tremendous amount, tremendous. Um, it shows how powerful this, 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 this approach is. Um, and here, you see uh, a pieces of an article written in the New York Times uh, that um, uh, that highlights the 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 creation of one of the of one national park, the the Yamas um, Yaguas National Park, um, and and it's incredible. Just incredible. And if you look at the maps and, and the amount of idea uh, uh, that's been uh, bring in some to, to create conservation ideas or has some, some degree of protection, it's huge. This is one of the examples, a result of those uh, as, um, of their work. And here we have uh, Simone Adair, also a TCD, um, a former TCD student. She's now the faculty of the Florida uh, International University, 2.5 hours away from you, if you are in Gainesville. Um, she and her team received a grant from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundations. I know they're collaborating with a few museums uh, to advance the protection of the transboundary biocultural riverscape in Western Amazon. Uh, so the field that started with uh, Luisa Maffi in a conference in 1996 um, has the potential, I think, to expand during this time a lot more. And what Simone says here is we need to promote interdisciplinary opportunities for connection. And it is our hope, my hope, that TCD would just would, would do that. Um, and one of the initiative, new initiatives to do it is this uh, new uh, biocultural panel series that we hope will continue to engage uh, with the leaders that we interview and faculty and students at um, uh, University of Florida. So, and this is about where I'm gonna finish here. These are the, the two panels, they're more or less uh, down. The first one is certainly happening. The December 1st for Faisal, Dr. Faisal Mula will come to Gainesville and talk to you to the role of biocultural education in supporting indigenous lake conservation. And in March uh, next year, we will have Dr. David Santiev, likely March 29, 
uh, talk about curriculum and uh, biocultural conservation. And we also hope to have um, uh, either one, the Field Museum and the American History of Natural History, American Museum of Natural History. Um, and that will be it, I think. Oh, no, this is big. I, there is a list of people here that I'm super, extremely grateful for uh, supporting this work and for the time and dedication to the field and for giving me so much time in between interviews and emails. Um, and I will leave the last one because I like it. It's very simple, biocultural conservation, conservation with the people and for the people, that's TITA. Okay, that's it. Right.